just by way of introduction, I come from the dark side. I, I worked in precious metals derivatives at Citibank from 1994 to 1999 uh, and uh, energy derivatives after that to 2002 and then I left the bank. And in that time there were a number of things that were done, seen and, and uh, participated in. Uh, that some people have alluded to today, whether they be central bank swaps and other things, whether they're surreptitious or not, I don't know. Um, sorry, I can't comment. Because um, when you leave a bank after being in a, a position that I was in, uh, you have to sign a confidentiality agreement that is binding forever. So um, that kind of checks a few things, but I'm always happy to have a private chat with everybody at any stage. <coughs> Basically, uh, when I left the bank, uh, I went and uh, I'd, I'd done a lot of uh, uh, investigation myself into um, gold that hadn't been produced yet that was being sold into the market and what effect that has on the gold price and a number of other things. And I just came to the conclusion that I don't think I could really work in that market anymore, so I uh, moved to gold. And then I <coughs> left and worked for a high net worth individual for a couple of years, uh, building him a precious metals uh, equ equities and, and physical portfolio. Uh, and then had a couple of years off, uh, and uh, then in 2007 decided that the market was almost ready to embrace a precious metals fund in Australia, being that there was not one in existence that was available to anybody and I found that out through uh, my father having a stroke and having to look after his super and all the other bits and pieces and my mother didn't want me involved in managing it basically and she said that she wanted to get a cheque once a month from one of these, you know, uh, what do they call these things, uh, uh, allocated pension, didn't want to worry about anything, blah blah blah, so we got in and we went through a number of different fund managers, products, etc. And of the at last count, about six and a half thousand funds that were offered, there was not one precious metals alternative that was available to be ticked. And I thought, well, I might be onto something here, so why don't we take this to uh, the market? So we went and set up a precious metals uh, fund structure um, and put everything in place. And we thought we'd be going to go around and raise some money. And it shouldn't be that hard, you know, gold's been going up for five years, surely it's on the radar screens of people. Um, although, for the previous four years I'd been called some pretty horrible stuffing, questioning my parentage and all sorts of things when you were talking about fair currency systems and uh, whether, that, that uh, discussing the realities that I, the way I saw them that actually challenged a lot of people's um, sense of uh, security basically when you sit back and talk about a mountain of debt to someone who's sitting in a three million dollar house with 2.3 million dollar mortgage he doesn't want to hear that you know there's there, there's a significant risk in changes in uh, in, in the way that the system's going to work and uh, you get kind of um, get kind of unpopular you don't get invited to too many barbecues um, anyway we we thought about this logically I'm, I'm my partner's in this this uh, uh, venture, um, uh, my mate Mark Long, I've known for 25 years, and he just finished a couple of years ago as the head of commodities for Merrill Lynch in Asia. So we're not dummies and we're not not crazy, but um, the reaction that we've got from from people in the funds management industry has been nothing short of hostile almost at times, um, and. Um, I'll, I'll, I'm going to walk you through sort of what's happened for us in the three years that we've been begging for capital from institutions in Australia to um, allow people to have a box to tick that allows them to get away from the balanced portfolio that is what everybody says you've got to have, 35% local equities, 30% global equities, 15% property, 5% bonds and some alternatives. And where does gold fit in there? And gold fits in alternatives. The same as in there with three-dimensional mathematic rocket scientists, sort of um, algorithmic 
mean reverting trading things that are going to blow up at some stage. They always will. They always do. It doesn't matter how smart you are. Long-term capital management were the smartest guys ever invented, and they nearly destroyed the world. Now, so so we so we thought, well, let's do this logically, and so we, we went first up to some people who we knew, and you know, working in banking for 15 or so years, you get to know a few people around, and and, and people change jobs, and we went and saw a few people that we knew at different fund managers or different fund of fund managers, and. I suppose. So, and, and certainly, there's a lot of money that's managed in industry uh, super funds that um, uh, I, d I don't think the people who actually have their money in there know what's going on. Um, the people who are managing it, or sorry, the trustees of, the, of, of most of these industry supers have got a. Um, a uh, truck driver or a publican or a union rep or whatever else on the trustees, they don't want anything to do with any of the responsibility of investment management or anything else. So they basically defer that responsibility to an asset consultant. And there's a few of those in Australia, there's probably half a dozen or so, but mainly, the, I think, I don't want to name names, but um, there's, there's a half a dozen of them, say. And some smaller ones. Anyway, we, we went and saw all these industry funds, and we're talking about, you know, they've got $10 billion or $15 billion under management, it's a fair whack of cash. And um, <coughs> so these guys were like, okay, yeah, we, we, we understand, we, we're in, yeah, that's pretty interesting, but you've got to go through the asset consultants. And, the, and we thought, okay, well, we'll go and see the asset consultants. And, um, and that was, that was, that was eye-opening. Basically, um, the asset consultants that we met with, and we sort of um, gave up with after a little while, um, we, we went with a discussion that gold's an asset class of its own, it's not, not, not an alternative, and we went there for the discussion. Not necessarily to go there and ask them to you know, give us some money, do anything, but to actually work out why they don't have any gold and how, we, how, how do we get it involved in, in mainstream fund, you know, it's not something that's just been invented, it's been, it's only been in 40 years that it hasn't been the bedrock of the financial system, you know, like to, you know, you use the, the pyramid, you know, the, the, the core stable part of a pyramid, the base of it there, you know, of the financial system previously was physical gold, and, uh, and that pyramid's been turned upside down now with just a tiny small amount of gold with actually no, no base to... Um, so that, that, that pyramid's pretty unstable with all these derivatives and shit up the top here. And, uh, and paper and everything else uh, going to fall over. Anyway, we, we, we met up with some people and we're sitting across the table in the boardroom and, and um, we like to take real gold with us because it's amazing how many people who work in the financial markets have never seen an ounce of gold yet. They will have a million ounce of gold futures position. And they, they had never seen a one ounce gold coin, and they'd certainly never seen a one kilo bar. And a kilo bar is pretty impressive, all right? It's, it's one of the great chick magnets of all time, I think. Um, the, the, um, the kilo bar is on the desk, clunk on the, on the top. And this, uh, this guy who's very senior in, in one of the um, asset consultants um, says, well, that's no different to iron. No different to iron. You know, and we're talking about money. He said, oh, yeah, well, they used tulips as currency once. I said, yeah, well, they used cigarettes and all the other different bits and pieces. And um, he, was, he was hostile to the point of, of, of this... Uh, it's, you know, it's basically ridiculing our discussion and our arguments. Yeah. Um, and if you know Longy and I, we sort of like just let the steam build up and until till it sort of blows up. And anyway, we had to take it from from these guys. But what was what was the the, the difficult part was the willful ignorance of these people to be so narrow-minded that maybe just maybe this thing that they've been running with for the last 20 years or thereabouts that some Harvard economics guy dreamed up that this is the perfect portfolio that disregards this, which is disregarding a significant amount of human history. Um, 
that maybe, 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 maybe there is a better mouse trap, and that part of that is included in gold. And um, anyway, we um, we agreed to disagree, but it was like they were not going to change their mind in any way, shape, or form, no matter what what happens, no matter what happened with. How was this thing work? Yeah, yeah. That one. This is this is a pretty simple. Ten years comparative asset class. Right. Gold's fantastic. But, you know, all these other things that they're in that make up this beautiful balanced portfolio. It's been a significant underperformance, but it's been for ten years. This has not been a one-off one year that that you know. Kingston Town won all the races, or something like this. Is this is this is um, this is a trend. This is this is something that shouldn't be ignored, and it is clearly being ignored. Um, last night, because I didn't want to, didn't want to check. Um, I didn't want to make any statements that might end up being a little bit false. Um, I went through and I checked a couple of the uh, balance funds, and I went to one group, and funnily enough, they did have gold in their. Um, Balanced portfolio, and it was three percent, and it was the GLD, the the gold, the GLD ETF, and we'll get onto that in a little while, as to why that isn't gold, and that anyone who pays the full price for an ounce of gold for somebody else to hold on to in the subcustodians, where somebody has the right to willfully default at any time, is an idiot. Anyway, the biggest holders of the GT, G, the GLD are. Soros and Paulson, two biggest hedge fund managers in the world. A lot of people think just because they do it that it's the right thing for them, and we'll go into why. Um, it might be the right thing for them, but it's certainly not the right thing for, uh, for, for, for people who own gold for different reasons. Anyway, we, we thought well, we're not going to get anywhere with these asset consultants, so how, 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 do, we, uh, how do we do it? Well, we thought, well, maybe some of the big family, big rich families in Australia will understand it um, and talk about wealth preservation and all the other bits and pieces rather than return, which is what you're going to talk to fund managers about. You've got to talk to them about return and what's the return going to be and outperformance and blah, blah, blah. Well, when you go and sit and talk to one of the richest families in, the, in Australia and you sit there and you say, you know, the best thing that can happen, I'm sorry, the worst thing that can possibly happen out of what we're proposing for you to do is you end up with a whole lot of gold. And the best thing that can happen is that you end up with a whole lot of gold. Right? And that kind of makes sense to some. And then you have that these family officers can make a decision because they don't have so much of this bureaucratic bullshit that they've got to go through when they're reporting to this and making sure you got that. Um, anyway, so we went through, with, 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 through and, and we, we got a bit of traction with, with, um, with some of the... Um, the, 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 the price that they wanted to extract for putting money in the fund was a little, a little heavy in that they want to take control of your company and not pay any fees and all sorts of things like that. And it's really hard to run a business that way. Anyway, um, what was fantastic was that we ran into a couple of families. We ran into one family, and, and they're, I guess, top... 20 in your BRW list or whatever you want to call it. So they're more than a billion dollars. And they have an $80 million gold exposure, and we talked about it with them. And $40 million of it is in the GLD, and $40 million of it is in GDX, the gold producer ETF, which is just gold for dummies. You know, it really is. If, if, if you want to buy producers, you don't buy something that's just 34 stocks all stuck in together there and you don't have any control or idea as to what, um, what ones you've got in there. There's some, some in GDX you just shouldn't own. Some of the biggest ones that are in there that you shouldn't own. <coughs> Pardon me. So we went through and had a discussion about the GLD and why for a family company in Australia, a family office in Australia, that to have a $50 million physical, what they say is a physical gold exposure um, through the GLD is not what it, what it appears. And we went through that um, the, the willful default clause. We went through the, the uh, custodian issues that there are. We also pointed out that the reason that you have this gold exposure is that 
when the shit hits the fan that you can get your hands on it pretty quickly. You don't want counterparty risk, you don't want all these different things and basically you've given the full price of gold to somebody else to control in another country that they can say at any particular time, probably when you most want the gold, that, oh, no, we're not going to give you the gold, we're just going to give you cash settlement from last night's rate close. That's not a gold exposure, all right? That's just a price-tracking mechanism, and you don't have... That's not the reason that you have it. When one of the family members comes in and says, where's our gold because everything's blown up, and you go, well, it's in a vault in London or something, and... Um, uh, XYZ custodian has just said, oh, by the way, we're going to um, willfully default uh, and last night the price was $1,410 and that's what we're going to pay you out at when you know full well that the price right now is $4,000, for instance. That's not a really good deal and it defeats the purpose of why you have that goal. So that was, that was, that, that was interesting, an interesting discussion. Then to talk about the GDX, and we talked about the GDX, and that the G, that, that is 34 gold companies which um, uh, have different, have different um, uh, values or sorry, proportion hold, holdings, and um, we went through with them that you know as a as a as 34 34 um, gold companies, yes, it's going to be it's going to get the you know, the rising tide floats all boats sort of thing. That they're going to get the move up, but why wouldn't you have some expertise and pick the right ones and outperform that? And we showed them that our 12 stock portfolio that we have uh, outperformed the GDX since its inception by 75%, which is a material sort of number. Um, yet all 12 of ours are in the, in the GDX. So it's, it comes down to a little bit of, um, of specialisation. And... <sighs> In the end, the, the, the guys who, who, uh, who, who run the, the, the money said that we're not gold experts. We, um, we, we normally buy buildings or we buy businesses or whatever else it is, but we've got some gold and you know, that's, that's how we're doing it. And, um, and, as I, and I said to them, that, look, if you buy buildings, if you buy a $100 million building... Um, you're going to get the best architect in the world to come and check out your building's not going to fall down, or a structural engineer, or whatever else, and get the best dudes in there to do. To, to, to. Well, this $80 million gold exposure you've got is no different to that. And you've just said to me yourself that you're not an expert and you're just doing it, this is how it is. Well, there's, there's your answer. So we went to and fro, and anyway, it was agreed that, or they agreed that um, they thought that whilst um, what we say was correct, that they were going to continue to do as they do and um, that if we had any good stock tips that maybe they would profit share with us if we gave them those tips. And um, we declined that. The um, interesting part of that, though, is that they know they're on the right horse. They're just in the wrong race, if you know, if, if you know what I mean. It's, they, they've... Um, They've got the right kind of exposure. They've got the gold price exposure, and they've got. But the the reasoning behind it that they have for having the gold in the first place is undermined by the way that it's held. Um, and the same again with the GLD ETF or the GDX. What? Why would anybody pay full value for shares and not have them in your own name, in your own? Uh, thing? I just don't understand that. Anyway. So that, was, so that was kind of a challenge, and, and, and that's when I got to the stage of thinking that if we can't convince someone who's got the understanding and the reasoning and everything else about why gold and all the other bits and pieces, if we can't convince them that there's some value added in, in what we do and all the other bits and pieces, well, we might as well just stop. And um, we haven't done that yet, but we're pretty bloody close. Anyway, the... Main part, that, so we were saying, we'll get back to these other clowns, these called, guys called asset consultants. Um, these, <coughs> these guys um, control about $850 billion of the $1 trillion super fund pool. All right? No one can get anywhere near it unless they say so. And for them to include precious metals in any way, shape or form, apart from as an alternative, they have to admit that what they've currently got is flawed. 
And that's not going to happen because they get paid shitloads of fees on managing this stuff. I'm talking big amounts of money. Now, to have a evidence of return and to have a, a chart that does that and for someone to say we don't want to be in that, notwithstanding all the other fiat currency, macro, every other damn thing that happens, for someone to say that we don't, we don't want to be part of is just crazy. And I'm, um, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm a little bit more um, sort of, uh, military than most, but I, uh, that these guys, someone sooner or later, when the next 30% equity market correction comes or whatever else it is, um, and there's going to be some pissed off old people who are going to sit there and not have their super anymore or whatever, and they're going to come back and say, hey, you guys didn't even give us the box to tick, and we think that's negligent by omission. You guys are the professionals. You guys are the guys who are supposed to do all this fantastic stuff, and you didn't have any gold. I would be surprised if everybody who has a super, you know, you know, clearly smart people manage their own, um, although that does cost some money. Um, people who have money in a super fund to a man I would expect thinks that the investment manager that they have would have some gold. When they wake up in the morning and gold, they talk, all they're talking about on the TV is 1400 gold and this and that and da 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 da. There's not a person there who's got money in a super fund who wouldn't think, well I'm sure they've got some gold in my super fund and none of them do. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. At the same time, dumbasses like me go over and sit there and educate these people and give them as clear evidence as you want just simply through that. But going through um, seven years of, of, of the macros and all the different things and showing the number of times that things have happened that we already said were going to happen. Uh, and then they come back and go, oh, well, it's gone too far, we're in a bubble. And you say, hang on a second, last week I was a moron for thinking what I think and now it's over? Come on, that you can't jump from you're an idiot to it's, it's a bubble and everybody's in. There's no chance in the world that that can possibly be the case because I expect that guy who called me a moron to ring me up before the bubble gets in to say, which stock should I buy or which whatever. Yeah, where, 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 what's the best way to get some gold or what's whatever. Then again, maybe he is... Um, uh, um, reticent to do that because he's embarrassed because he doesn't want to talk to me now because he called me a dickhead and now who's the dickhead now? Uh, and um, anyway, you know, you know what I mean. And that, that's that's pretty tough. Now, what what then happens is that if you get lucky and you find a fund that doesn't have an asset consultant. All right, that if, you, if, if, if you do, and, and I know there's a couple of them, and they can actually make a decision. So you can get in there and you can say, look, this is the really great thing to do. You really should have 10% in gold, some in producers, some in, in physical, some da da da. And they sit there and they say, oh, I fully agree, but no, nah, can't do it. And they sit and you say, well, what, what are you talking about? He says, yeah, I know I, I know I should, but the risk to my business if they leave the herd is just too great. And by that, if everybody loses 30% of your money and they lose 28, they think they're a fucking hero. Seriously. But if everybody loses 20% of their money and he loses 22, it's the end of the world for him. All right? He doesn't care about returns for the people. He's caring about what the performance is relative to all the other guys so people don't take their money away from him and he doesn't get paid his basis points for managing the money or whatever else. So, <laughs> quite frankly, there is a divergence in, uh, in, in what is the desired outcome between you as the investor and him as the manager. Right? Now, I don't know how, how, you, can, um, how you can change that, but when... 
<clears throat> when they think a big deal is that XYZ fund manager is only going to be eight, <coughs> sorry, 25 per cent in Aussie equities and 35 per cent in offshore equities uh, and 8 per cent in, they've got a minute difference between everybody else's and it's a little bond play or it's a something else, some other little bits and pieces. They think that's a big deal. Well, what's a big deal is to sit back and say, we're putting 20% exposed to precious metals, all right? Um, they, they just can't possibly be done. Couldn't do it for 5%. Now, when you think about the $1 trillion super pool, that's the super pool, not including what people in just normal investment funds and other bits and pieces. The trillion dollar super pool, if we get 1% goes in, there's $10 trillion, which is bigger than the biggest gold fund in the world, which is BlackRock, which is $8 billion, $9 billion. Uh, so all of a sudden, you've just bought BlackRock's gold fund out. Right? Now, what that does to a very small pool of um, in producers, for instance, is phenomenal. If you think about the... <coughs> the, the the Huey index of 15 gold stocks or whatever else it is has a market cap of around $210 billion, which is Microsoft sort of thing. Right? So you can get basically 40 million ounces of gold. Um, sorry, it's more than, more than that. You, you, you're getting um, about 40%, sorry, of world gold reserves and production out of there for the same market cap as Microsoft. And you know, people say to me, I wrote, I wrote a paper once when Google was at 500 bucks and gold was at 530 bucks, and it was whether you'd own Google or gold, and people just they, people couldn't understand it, and they'd sit there and they say, "Well, this is a fund manager type of argument. Oh, you can't have a discounted cash flow on gold. It doesn't earn interest. It doesn't do this. It doesn't do that, and blah blah blah." And I said, "But anyone can out Google Google, but you can't out gold gold." And that the simple part of that is that. Google's just the thing, it's just a man-made thing that someone else can come up with and someone will, someone will do that. And for it to be priced at the same price as an ounce of gold, I thought it was quite laughable. So now gold's at 1400 and Google's at 400 and I'm pretty, it, it, it was the right thing to, to argue, I guess. Um, anyway, so... Um, where was I? Did my ADD plays up on me a lot? Um, yeah. So anyway, so so yeah, the big deal is if, if they to, to move to um, uh, the goal to to a, a good proportion of gold, it's just not going to happen. Um, that an that that an asset class that has been taught to their managing directors and chairmen or whatever else that there is who all came through the same business schools etc cetera, etc cetera, who have all been taught same Keynesian economics and supply side theory and uh, is being basically destroyed in front of their eyes and they don't know what to do but they just keep doing the same thing is just laughable um, and they charge people for the right to do it. I, th I think it's quite crazy. Anyway, so we, so we, we got to um, uh, start talking with, with these fund, fund managers about um, real assets versus paper assets and, and um, uh, that how, how, um, how can you value in the, with you know, the discounted cash flows, all the other bits and pieces, a, a balance sheet that you can't possibly read. There's, one of the guys earlier was talking about he was an accountant. Well, if you could read 3M's accounts in less than a year, I'll give you a medal. Seriously, there's, you know, the, there's, it, it's just a disaster, all these big ca companies and banks and whatever else. And start looking at assets, of, assets and balance sheets of banks and all of a sudden you've got mark to myth type of um, asset prices. You've got all sorts of stuff that you just can't value versus... Real, real stuff, and that's what I said to these guys that buying precious metals um, uh, equities of producers with, say, a cut off of two million ounces of gold in the ground, proven and probable that resources don't count, that you know what's in the ground there, right? And, and that no matter what the price of that stock does, those assets in the ground well, that don't change. And it was something that we talked about with one guy when we had the big pullback in 2008 and we had gold stocks basically down 75%, no matter which one it was. 
And um, you know, when we when we saw a gold corp at nine bucks or something like that, you know, I wrote out a thing to say to everyone, but there's there's free gold. You know, the, the asset base did not change from the price the time the price the, the gold in the ground didn't change from the the price of being at 45 bucks to when it was 11 dollars or whatever it was. And that's what people don't get with producers. Your asset base doesn't change. It's just the cost per ounce that you're buying them at. Right? That is, is what you're looking at in the ground. And so a number of the metrics that we use in, in our um, how we put together our how do we pick out 12 sort of thing, which I'm not going to tell you how we not all the things that we do, but you know, we have some pretty basic guidelines and and, and the first one is it's, it's metal in the ground. We have, have to, um, a cutoff of two million ounces proven and probable gold or silver equivalent. Okay, now it's only 60 companies or 63 companies in the world that do that, and some of them you wouldn't own because they're big multi-polymetallic miners, you know, Western Mining and Freeport McMoran, for instance. Yeah, they're proper companies, so we don't want that. We want pure precious metals sort of stuff. Um, and then you'd look at you know, hedging, or you know, if, 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 if hedging is a, a pretty um, nasty uh, sort of thing that, can, that comes up, being that my background of um, building those types of books, and uh, they can be used for good and they can be used for evil, and mostly they end up being evil. So I think it's best to clear, stay pretty clear from them. Um, then, we, then we'll have, uh, you, then we'd look at, at a number of other things here. Where's the company listed? Or sorry, not where it's listed, where's it incorporated? Big difference between where a company's incorporated because I think someone else mentioned today, you know, um, you want Commonwealth countries, you want, com you want um, uh, companies that are incorporated into Commonwealth countries because you've got 1,100 years of British common law property rights that basically I think there'll be wars about in Canada and Australia if um, things that happen in the US where basically the law is as good as your money can buy and big interests will basically take control of things because they can. Um, so looking at things like that, then you look at sovereign risk and you have a look at, at um, where is this place? Has it got more than one mine? Has it got, um, uh, yeah, th when you think about it, you know, a one mine company is a lot more risky than a three mine company even if they produce and have the same number of ounces and they have the same number of reserves and all the other bits and pieces, you want the three operating mines going there because if one, if you've got a one mine thing there and it screws up, something happens and it's lost, which I remember pretty famously, Durban Deeps came out here and bought in 1996, they bought Hargraves Resources, I think it was, they paid 400 million bucks for an underground mine up near Bathurst and the day they wrote the cheque out, the money was paid. The next day, the first guy, they went in, they drilled a hole into the wall and it hit an artesian bore and flooded the thing out and it's never been operated again. Now, that's just bad luck, but that's what happens when you've got one mine, one thing. That, that, that's the sort of thing that happens in gold mines, you know, gold mining. So it's inherently risky, but you try and, really try and take away as much of that risk as you can. Um, as I say, you know, our, our 12 people, we like to build our portfolio of, 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 of stocks and then sit there and say, right, let's just pretend this is one company. And by that, we sit there and say, right, if we've got 8% Heckler and 7% Gold Corp or whatever, blah, 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 build it in and we sit there and turn it into one producer. And basically, our portfolio <coughs> has uh, uh, 28 million ounces of gold in the ground. It has about 1.1 billion ounces of silver. Um, it's got, whatever, 23 producing mines in 17 countries and, and it's got an average market capitalisation of about 10 billion. All these different things that you can do to get yourself into this nice, kind of tight little spot. And sovereign risk is a big issue. You know, if you look at, um, you know, you don't want to be in Venezuela or, you know, old Chavez, whatever he did, he pulled the pin on um, Crystal X, which was a one of the biggest gold mines in the world that has been yet to be um, ex uh, ex yet to be exploited, and uh, basically their market cap went from two billion dollars to a hundred million dollars overnight when he said we're just changing the rules. So you know, South Africa is a bit of an issue. There's a whole bunch of different things that that there are. Um, you know, if 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 we were um, making a portfolio for an American investor or rather than an Australian investor, we wouldn't have Newcrest in it. Right? But for an Australian investor, you've got to have Newcrest in it because that's 
one of the big risks that, they ha that, we, that there is is that if we have a big trade war and we have a big um, currency wars and all the other bits and pieces and everyone gets pissed off with each other and everyone nationalises their own mines and all the other bits and pieces, um, well, if you own everybody else's mines and not Newcrest, um, at least you've got ownership of something in your own country. Um, and that's, that's, that's going to... You know, these sorts of things you just can't discount. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but they certainly can. Um, what else would you have here? The... Um, oh, the yeah, the GDX, the, the, the gold producer index, uh, which is what a lot of the fund managers are using because they don't have... No one has any expertise or, or experience, really, in, in, in precious metals equities, basically. Uh, in 2002, when I left the bank, but, uh, we, I think about half of the gold uh, analysts in the world were basically sacked in that year. Uh, gold price was 260 bucks, whatever else it was, and I don't know what they did, but now you've got people come back and you just have to watch um, Bloom, whatever CNBC or Bloomberg in the morning or whatever. Everyone's a gold expert now. All right? As I say, you know, these, these people who didn't know a gold, ounce of gold existed a week ago are now sitting there saying, oh, yeah, well, you know, this and that and inflation and blah, 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 and they still don't address the underlying issues as to why it's happening. No, one, no one's addressing that, and um, uh, it's really quite simple to, uh, to, to hang your shill on being right for a week with the gold price going up 100 bucks. Um, I, I think most people, if they're, if they're sensible, will take note of old people because right? basically what's happening now is just a repeat of what happened when our grandfathers died. And most of us don't have our grandfathers that tell us how fucked up things were back then and how it got there. But there's some old Italian, pe old, old Italian people and Germans who've lived through what happens when you destroy your currency and debauch your currency through debasement. And they're the people who you really need to talk to. Now, I, I just... What else is in there? Oh, don't worry about that. This is only gold and gold mining shares as a percentage of global assets. Yeah, call it 25 per cent over the, since 1920 or whatever, and we're down here with nothing. All right. Now the amount of money that can fly into precious metals equities, notwithstanding just the sheer amount of gold that's not available to be bought, and we're talking about real gold, not paper gold. There's a big difference between paper gold and real gold, and we might talk about that a bit later. Um, but that's, that's frightening. You think of that, that amount of that, that sort of numbers, where to, to suggest to someone, oh, we could have a five-fold increase in the gold in, uh, uh, of the gold portfolio, they're like, oh, really? They said, well, have a look at Heckler Mining in the last six months. It's gone from $1.80 to $9. Right? And that's a real company. They've got 150 million ounces of silver in the ground. It's a fantastic little company um, that no one knows anything about. Um, then lastly... I thought the last word, we always let Alan Greenspan have the last word because, you know, he's up here or somewhere around here, feed money, has no place to go to gold. But I, think, I think everyone's pretty much aware with his 19, of his 1966 Golden Economic Freedom uh, essay, and if you haven't read it, go to the net, get it, read it, and give it to everybody you know, and that will basically give you a clear understanding of money and why we are where we're at. Um, anyway, the central banks, central banks being net buyers of gold, uh, 450 tonnes, basically. But have a look at it. Bangladesh. I didn't think they could feed themselves, let alone buy 30 tonnes of gold from the IMF. All right? Now, why, what, what's happening here? I don't look on the Argentina, Brazil, all these people who have had serious economic dislocations in their countries in the last 10, 15 years. Argentina, you had the you know, 1999, they were the basket case. Uh, India, China, Russia, well, there's the traditional things there. China... First time since 1952 that the, that the people of China have been able to buy gold, let alone anything else. So in 2008, they got permission to buy gold. They didn't get permission to go in and buy futures. They got permission to buy physical gold. Um, so yeah, the deficit spending is simply a scheme for the confiscation of wealth. Gold stands in the way of this insidious process. And that's from the guy who produced the greatest deficits ever ever around. A cynic might suggest that actually what he did has proved this this theory. Um, and as the, la the last bit I'll leave you with, and, and I, we, 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 like I say, you know, mum used to say money doesn't grow on trees, or money grows on, money, money doesn't, it, it doesn't, it's found in the ground, and a gold, gold mine is nature's printing press. Basically, um, an ounce of gold, in the, a, a, a producer with reserves in the ground is a non-maturing core option on gold. 
Simple as that, right? You can you could buy a call option, and the maturity date runs out. But while that goal's in the ground, you have the upside completely, and that's um, where the natural leverage is, and that's why you should be in, certainly in the in the in the, um, uh, in the producers and real gold. And you should see Janie about that from the Boyan Company, and I'm sure she'll give you a lovely price on one of them. They're really good. <laughs> so. Um, Anyone wants to have a chat later or whatever, I'll be around. And um, who, who, who was it who spoke about the BIS gold swaps? That's Someone? Bob, Bob Is Bob, Bob around? Bob is he at the back there? Um, you said that you only had 10 years of BIS balance sheet or whatever it was, annual reports, was it? Okay, well, I'll give you a heads up. If if there is nothing between 1994 and 1999, then, then, then there's something that we should talk about. Because I was on the other side of those deals. We were doing gold swaps with the BIS from 1994 to 1999. And if they don't have it in their reports, then something's up. No, because I know I, I did it. I think I could have gone back that far. 2000 was the last I looked at. OK, well, have a little dig. But you didn't hear that from me. <laughs> Yeah, thank you.